All right. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our summer online course, Sport in America. Uh, all of you know who I am, uh, Mr. Murphy. I teach, obviously, usually in school, I teach English and I teach logic and civil discourse for eighth graders. But for this uh, summer course, I actually teach history. Um, so we'll get into why that's actually a good fit for me to teach that and hopefully why it's a good fit for you to take this course during the summer. Uh, I'm really excited for it. Uh, I think after last year, kind of first year doing it, working out the kinks, working out the issues. Um, hopefully it'll be a better experience for you guys this year. Uh, you'll be able to learn, learn a lot more, get a lot more out of it. Um, cause that's really ideally the goal. Okay. That you're interested in learning about something that you wouldn't have the chance to during the normal school year. So you're going to take this class during the summer and really you're going to get out of it what you put into it. Um, if you put, uh, some good effort into it, if you really want to show the desire to learn from this course, you will be able to. Uh, and if you don't, it won't be as great for you. Um, so for this lecture, I'm just going to give us some kind of a rundown of some housekeeping stuff you should know about the course. Uh, and I'm going to start the very beginning of it on here, too, uh, as I'm going to send you in emails. Several emails, at least. Uh, this is the main source of information for this course. It's not the only one. Uh, you know, I'll have various different things on the Canvas site for you to access. Uh, but this is really your main spot for learning from the course. So I'm just gonna take you through, I'm gonna share my screen for a moment. Awesome. So if you're not sure how to get here, go to hermits.com. And if you're on your Chromebook, this is already bookmarked. Um, but if you're not on your Chromebook, so I'll, I'll just show you how to get there from the actual website. You go to academics here, Canvas online. Scroll down here. Students and faculty. Click on that. So I get to add to my massive tab list here on the top of my ribbon. Now, this is my view. It's not going to be necessarily your view. So I'm going to actually take you over to what your view is, but it, it'll take you into the course from clicking on that button, right? It's pretty easy. This is your view of the homepage. Um, I'm not done it yet. I still have things to add, but the first couple weeks are pretty much done. Like unit one, what I'm calling pre-unit one, unit one is basically done, except for me recording these videos. Um, you'll see here I have the slide decks, the slideshows that I use in my videos. I already have them uploaded. So you know, if you want to uh, do one of your assignments, you want to go back and say, ah, you know, Mr. Murphy kind of skimmed through that or he went to it through it too fast. You know, I want to slow it down so I could look at that slide a little longer. Well, you can actually just access the slideshow without my um, video on it. Right. So the video is important, of course, but these are here more for after the fact. If you need to go back and look at the beginning at a slower pace, you can find them. Um, you'll see our assignments lining up along here. Again, I haven't finished all the assignments for later on in unit two and unit three, but unit done is, one is pretty much done. In order to find these videos, you go to pages. So I have a little tab here for pre recorded lectures. The video um, sizes are too large to work uh, to be to house them all on Canvas. So what I did was create a YouTube channel. So you just cut and paste this link. And it'll bring you to my YouTube channel for this course, as you can see. Um, I have not, obviously, this is the first video, so there are no none uploaded yet. But um, in order to get those pre recorded lectures, which again are very important to this course, that's how you'll go through and get to the pages. You'll put in this link to YouTube, and all the lectures will be housed there. Um, so hopefully that makes sense for everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, come back here. Um, this is your first place to look um, in this course for anything. It's these videos are the most important thing. Um, I have it broken down weekly. So um, I'll get into that in a second. I'll show you the syllabus and all that. It'll be posted on uh, Canvas as well. Um, but let me just get to, I should probably just get to my first uh, slideshow here, kind of give you an introduction to what we're going to be looking at this semester, this summer semester. So. Share my screen again. 
some of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I already covered in that introductory email I sent you guys last week, um, but I'm also going to cover some more stuff. All right. Sport in America this summer um, with yours truly. Okay. So here's what we're going to learn. Um, you may or may not have read the description of the course, but this is not where I'm just going to say, hey, let's start in 1875 and let's just run down every year and see who won championships and who was the MVP. And yeah, it, that, that's not how it's going to work, right? Now, you are going to learn histories of several American sports, um, chiefly baseball and college football. The reasons for those two is, A, because they are some of the most um, popular ones in American history. They're the ones that can teach us the most um about how uh, kind of americans viewed the world in the past um so there's the most that we can get out of them but also b is i'm i'm mo i have my most expertise in those two sports so uh it works both ways um you see my next line here i have ability to analyze and interpret primary sources that is do history so what i mean by doing history is um you're going to be kind of many historians in this course on your own and doing history isn't just reading secondary accounts when i say a secondary account or secondary source that's something somebody wrote after the fact after the history already happened so it's like a textbook written in 2022 about something that happened in 1950. that's important don't get me wrong secondary sources textbooks these are important um but i want you guys to see what it's really like to actually quote unquote do history and that we're going to be interpreting primary sources analyzing interpreting primary sources something that came from the time of the historical event uh, and then the next lecture, I'll show you an example of that and how you're going to do uh, your assignments when it comes to analyzing, interpreting primary sources. So I'm going to teach you how to do that. OK, but that's really what doing history is. If you're interested in history at all, it's a lot of this. It's a lot of primary sources. and We're going to work on those. How to synthesize various forms of information to coherent writing with an original thesis. This is just teaching you how to write. Um, it's not going to be quite like my English classes where you spend a ton of time on this. Um, but hopefully you'll be able to learn to take all this various information I'm giving you, synthesize it into a coherent form where it's like, all right, I'm going to make this argument. I'm going to use these things I learned from this course. I'm going to put this all together that Mr. Murphy didn't already put together for me. I'm going to take it from all these various things he gave me and give it into this one argument and write my paper on this because um, you are going to have an end of summer semester paper. Um, so these really are our main goals for the course this summer, as I'm realizing I should put a coaster down on my desk here. Uh, and that's a poor decision on my part. I haven't, I haven't done this in the home office in a while to these record videos, which I'm not really sad about. But, uh, yeah, so the syllabus, let's, uh, let's actually look at that. So first of all, it's not complete. Uh, I still, I'm still firming up a couple of things on here. So I haven't added it to Canvas yet, but it will be added soon. This is going to give us the basic rundown for the course this year. All right. So like I was talking about the course description I mentioned about five minutes ago. I'm actually going to read this whole thing out loud because I think it's important. I think I'm still sharing my screen. Let me just check. Yes. Okay. Um, this course will trace the history of American sport from the colonial era to the present day. Just make sure my mic's on too. All right. Cloning era to the present day. Students will engage with primary sources. I've mentioned that already. And online discussions to think critically about issues presented by developments such as amateurism, integration, and spectatorship, and more than that as well. This course is designed to foster a historically integrated understanding of sport. Whoa, Mr. Murphy, what the heck do you mean by that? I know that sounds complicated. Really, this is all this means. That is, sports are not only names, numbers, and championships, but also ideal lenses through which we can view the problems and values of a society. It's not just about memorizing who was the MVP in the American League in 1961. That's Roger Maris, if you care to know, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is, hey, we're gonna look at this sport and we're gonna see how different things that were happening in American history at that time can be explained through that sport, okay? It's not just segregating sport off to its own side as just statistics and names and championships, because it's more important than that. You can learn a lot about American history through looking through these sports, and that's the goal, all right? We already talked about the objectives, the method of instruction. So, yes, there's going to be approximately, give or take, 14 of these pre-recorded lectures, um, so a little more than one a week sometimes. 
Uh, each, they're going to about to be about an hour each. This one will be the first one's looking to be a little shorter, but they'll be about an hour each. Um, I already told you the slideshow is going to be on Canvas. Basically, it's going to work weekly. You'll have work you have to complete by the end of every week, and it's probably going to be two um, assignments. I'm going to get into really quick. No textbook. Um, you don't have to go out and buy anything. I am going to give you some readings to do, but you should be able to do them for free. Um, so don't worry about that. If you're interested in more things to read on these topics, please let me know. Uh, I can give you 8 million recommendations because I've read a lot of stuff about this. Um, also, throughout the course during our lectures, I will have little slides sometimes saying, hey, if you want to learn more about this that I can't get into here, read this book. Um, so pay attention to those. Have your uh, antenna up when I talk about those. Uh, course grading. It's a pretty simple breakdown. It's really into thirds. That extra class participation, 10%, basically, if you're not difficult for me and you just do everything you're supposed to do on time and all that, it's basically a free 10 points. All right. But really, the main thing you got to be worried about now is discussion posts and primary source analyses. All right. So a discussion post, it's going to be every week. I'm going to give you a discussion question from that week's lectures. OK, the discussion post, they will be on Canvas. So like just for instance, your first one's not due for another two weeks, which is good. I'm going to ease you into it. But for instance, I'm going to give you a discussion that you have to think about before you answer from our uh, week. So, for instance, baseball, I'm going to ask you, was the reserve clause a good thing for early professional baseball? That might mean nothing to you right now. Hopefully, it's going to mean something to you during uh, that lecture. All right. And so the idea here is, is you're going to make one post, a nice, thoughtful paragraph, right, thinking about the question I asked you. And then you're going to respond to somebody else's post. So it's two paragraphs there, essentially, um, every week. I, I'm debating this. I, I think I'm going to do this. I'm also going to give you my answers. Like, I'm going to write a discussion post on there to give you my answer. I'm not going to do that until after you guys do yours, because I don't want you to be influenced by what I think. Because these questions I give you, they there's not always one right answer. Um, there's a legitimate argument to be made on either side of a fence. And I don't want to give my my side and everybody thinks oh okay well miss murphy said this so i'm gonna agree with it you might think i'm wrong uh it's okay to think i'm wrong uh, a lot of these are going to be not you know uh 100 fact written in stone there are some things that are like that but a lot of things we're going to be doing in this course is hey here's this information i gave you you can make an argument on this argue this side or that side my eighth grade guys you should know how to do that um Take him an argument on one side, even if you don't necessarily believe in it as much, and making a good argument on that behalf. We're going to be working a lot on that. Primary source analyses. Remember, I'm going to talk to you more about this um, in my next uh, my next lecture, my next slideshow. Also, do every week. Um, we're going to consider a primary source to every, every week's lecture, and you write a one to two page analysis of that. All right. They can be a wide range of things. It could be a painting. It could be a written text. It could be a voice recording. Uh, there are going to be a lot of different things I'm going to give you for that. And then don't worry about this yet, but you'll have a final paper, six to eight pages. Not not so, super short, but not super long either. A, a substantial writing assignment. Um, you know, this, this course is a decent amount of writing. I'm not going to give you a ton of reading, um, but it is going to be, you're going to have to write a decent amount. Okay, so it's a trade-off there. I'm going to give you more details ahead. It'll just be due on the last day of the course. Don't worry about this right now. So you here, you can see I broke it down into weeks, right? Um, don't worry about this too much yet. Again, I'll post this on Canvas. You can go over it at your leisure. Um, but there are nine weeks uh, in this course. This first one is really just kind of getting us, getting our feet wet, getting our legs under us, making sure we know where we're at. So for instance, the course, the lecture I'm doing right now is going to be this, the sport in pre-industrial America. We're going to get to this after all the intro stuff. And then we're going to record another lecture that you should watch by the end of this upcoming week, sport in industrial America, which is 1865 to 1939. All right. Notice no assignments or readings for the first week. But we'll get into them the second week. Uh, I want you to notice here. So I left a week open. Since I'm not getting deep dives into a lot of sports, I'm going to send out a questionnaire or survey to you guys to ask you a sport that we're not really covering that you want to go more in depth on and whichever sport or maybe i'll let two the top two choices um i will devote a lecture to that week and you won't 
and you might have one discussion posted to on that. I'm not sure. Um, the discussion will be to be determined on that. Um, but mostly I'm interested in you guys. Yes, I'm still there. Staying call. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Where was I at? Uh, yeah, so I might have to do a little bit more research myself on these sports because I, I do know a lot, but some sports I don't know, you know, as much as other people do. So I might have to do some research on it, but I'm really, I want to set that week aside so you guys can really learn what you want to learn about uh, for that week. Because some of you guys have different sport interests than others, and I get that. Um, so we'll spend a week on that. And then you can see, you know, the three units here will take us to the end of the summer session. All right, so let's go back to the slideshow here. So that was the syllabus. The syllabus, excuse me. Again, it'll be posted. Uh, just so, just give you a little bit of my background, why I'm even doing this course, why it makes sense. I have two degrees in history, even though I don't teach history during the school year. I have a bachelor's degree in history. I have a master's degree in history. Um, American history, actually. So this makes me qual uniquely qualified, I think, to write this course. Um, hold on one second. Sorry. Sorry about that. When you're at home, sometimes you have to take care of things you wouldn't otherwise have to. Uh, anyway, what was I talking about? Yeah, so I actually studied sport history in college. Believe it or not, you can do that. Um, and I've written a couple articles on it. Uh, one that I wrote is probably going to be published. Uh, they, they, the the journal um, has gone back to me a couple months ago about making some changes before they publish it. I haven't had time during the school year, so I'll work on those changes. Um, during the summer and hopefully sometime next year you'll see something I wrote out there in the world um, so basically what I'm trying to get at in this I'm not trying to toot my own horn or anything I'm just trying to tell you that I know about this stuff. like this is this is my wheelhouse okay most of my expertise is in baseball history uh, I'm I'm best suited to teach baseball history uh, I also know a lot about college football history but it's not just those two uh, those two just happen to be the two I know the most about okay and not only, again, not only do I know the most about them, but I think that the most important, excuse me, for understanding American history in the last 150 years. So it goes hand in hand. So here's a real philosophical question for everybody. You know, if I were to ask you, what is history? I'd be interested to hear what people's responses are, because I think people can take it a bunch of different ways. Um, some people would just say the past, and I disagree that the history is the past. Right. If something happens in the past and nobody writes anything about it, nobody notices it, I wouldn't call that history. I would just call that the past. To me, history is how we understand the past, how we write about the past. OK, that's one way to think of it. Another way to think of it, study the change over time. Right. Why do we study history? We want to see how things have changed over time. You know how we drive cars today and not horse and wagon. Why we live in suburbs and not the city, stuff like that. Okay, we study how these things changed over time. You can say it's the study of humanity, right? It's the story of humans. What's our deal? How did, how did humans get to 2022? Why does the world look like the way it does now? You know, these things weren't accidents that they happened this way. Or, in my next line, it wasn't inevitable. You know, inevitable means it had to happen. Nothing in history had to happen. You know, it didn't, it wasn't inevitable that. The United States won World War II. It wasn't inevitable that 9-11 happened. It wasn't inevitable that the United States won independence from Great Britain, right? All these things could have easily changed based on small things, really small decisions people made in the past. Uh, and to me, that's fascinating that, you know, even the smallest of decisions can have these ripple effects outward that can completely change the course of history. Uh, that's fascinating to me. And also my last line is humility. Maybe a lot of Teachers wouldn't say this, but I, I think humility is important here um, to be humble, right? To realize that, you know, wow, we got to this point in history from the work of a lot of people. You know, a lot of people have sacrificed a lot in the world. Um, a lot of people have been repressed or oppressed, um, depressed in the 20, uh, 20, 21st century. Um, 
so it can really give you a sense of, wow, I'm just kind of a small player on a big stage. Um, not to say that every individual is important. Of course they are. But sometimes it's good to have have that um, sense of humility in us to realize, you know, the world doesn't revolve around us. There have been millions and billions of people who have come before us to lay the groundwork for where we're at today. Um, and I think that's important to remember when you're studying history. Let's get into it a little bit here, right? What is sport history? If you ask me, I would say it's studying sport in its historical context, right? Context is something that helps you understand something better. So if I just told you, you know, um, uh, what's a good example for this? Oh, you know, the Yankees scored 38 runs today. You're like, wow, that's ridiculous. How'd that happen? But then if I gave you context and say, oh, well, they faced a high school pitcher. Now it makes a little bit more sense, right? That context is important to understanding that fact. All right. So I know I've said this before, but I want to reiterate this again. It's not just statistics and names. That is not sport history. Okay. But really, it's how a sport has embodied or how it's fostered social, political, cultural, economic, all these different historical developments. Okay. And we're going to get into that more as we go along. Um, see all these books here? These are all ones I've read. Actually, these four. Uh, for you guys to recommend, some of these might be a little bit above your level. But War Fever, I actually considered assigning this to you guys for this summer, but I decided against it. Uh, I would recommend this for you guys. I would highly recommend. It's called War Fever, Boston Baseball. In America in the shadow of the Great War. Um, so it talks about World War One and, and how it affected Boston. And one of the characters it looks at is Babe Ruth when he was a Red Sox. Um, so I think that's a really good book for you guys if you want to get into that. Um, these are some other names. Uh, these are all people who wrote these books here. Um, you might, if you're big into baseball, you might see John Thorne around. Uh, he's MLB's official historian. Uh, he actually has a pretty active Twitter feed. So if you're on Twitter, um, give him a follow. If you're into baseball history, he will get in a lot of interesting stuff on there. Um, so these are just some general, you know, ideas before we start here. But let's even work this back a little bit farther. You know, why do humans even play? Right? That's all. Well, we're going to talk about what sport is. But sport at a fundamental level is about humans playing. And there's nothing rational about play. I mean, if you think about it. You know, if, if we go out and play a wiffle ball game, that's not helping my species survive necessarily, right? That might be distracting me from a search for food or a search for shelter in order to propagate my species further. It's not a biological necessity. There's no ticking clock in our hearts that makes, oh, shoot, it's time for us to go play, right? So why do we do it if it's so irrational? Um, eh, you can have many different reasons, right? Maybe the most important is to form relationships with people. Right. In a more informal setting, we might be more likely to form relationships with other people. And that's men are people are social animals. Right. We, we crave relationships. We crave social belonging. Uh, and sports are a great way to foster that. And I, I definitely believe that. That's why I think high school sports are very important um, for kids to form those types of relationships, not only with other students, but also between coaches, students and coaches, coaches and coaches, all those different forms. Right. Um, it turns the unexpected, excuse me, it turns the expected into the unusual. What do I mean by that? Well, when we go through life and everything is routine every day, I wake up at 6 a.m., I go to work or I go to school, I do the same thing every day, I go back home, I eat the same meal. It's boring, right? It doesn't really allow for us to have much creativity. But when we start to, when we have play, when we have games, right? Now, what was expected isn't necessarily, right? Crazy things. You guys can all name crazy things that have happened in sports games that have been unexpected or unusual throughout even the past two years. Right. And that's that's something that's not unique to sports, but it's really powerful in sports. And then let's also remember, it's not always frivolous. And by frivolous, I mean, you know, carefree um, results not being important. It can be serious and competitive. Right. Even if you look at not just humans, but animals. Right. Like lions play. OK. But they play because it's a serious matter of them preparing themselves to be a predator in, when they grow up, right? To be able to navigate the world, and not get eaten by another lion. Okay, um, it can be competitive and serious, and humans are the same way, as we know, right? Uh, everybody's concerned about the final outcome, the final result. Um, so it can be frivolous or serious. So this is my last slide for this 
presentation. You know, what does sport in pre-industrial America look like? And by pre-industrial, I hope you guys know what the industrial revolution is. Um, and if you don't, it comes around the 18, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> something in my throat. Starts basically early 1800s, late 1700s. It's so when you start seeing factories pop up, people start moving to cities, stuff like that. We'll talk about that more coming up. Okay, but right now we're talking about before that. So like American Revolution time, colonial time, 1600s, 1700s. What does sport look like in America at that time? And really it's a patchwork of local games, okay? Everything is localized. There's not really communication networks to talk to people from faraway places, okay? The transportation's really slow. As you see in this point I have here, right? You're, you're either going maybe by like a barge down a river, a sailboat, right? You might be going by horse and carriage, which is not very fast. So you don't really have much contact outside the world that's not directly around you, okay? So most of these sports are going to change very much depending on where you go in the different locales, all right? So, but some early popular forms of sports were early baseball, okay? You may have heard of these terms before, but you may not have. Rounders, old cat, town ball. These are all baseball similar to baseball. They came around before baseball. If you saw somebody playing rounders, you might recognize parts of it, but other parts would look weird. Um, early bowling was popular, believe it or not, like outdoor bowling, duck pin bowling, candlestick bowling, if you've heard of those things. Um, very popular. Um, cricket, which is another kind of bat and ball sport similar to baseball, very popular in these times. But again, the cricket in Cape May Courthouse might look very different than the cricket in Williamstown right, or the cricket in Vineland, okay, because these people just couldn't really talk to each other that much to determine, hey, how's your cricket look? How, what do you do when you have runners on base? Oh, we do that too, right? They don't have that same thing. Actually, there are no runners on base on cricket. I don't know why I said that, but um, it's, so it's informal. It's not, it's not standardized, right? You don't have defined teams roving around playing each other throughout different states. Um, the rules are different. There's not really equipment that goes to these sports. You just kind of show up. You maybe to play cricket, you find a stick. You roll together an old sock to make a ball, and you roll with it, right? Maybe you make something up on your own to figure it out. But this, it was popular. No matter what you were playing, people were still playing sports. I, I, I wouldn't call them sports, actually. Let me rephrase that. They are playing games, okay? So that gets me to my point. Well, what is a sport? And if you ask me the difference between a sport and a game, People will disagree with me, but these are the two big things I, I use here. And these are not my ideas. I've taken them from other people, but I've kind of formulated them in my own idea after that. So it has more organization or standardization than a simple game, right? If you guys go, you know, just take a, a, a ball at random and go behind Scarf and throw it around, right? I'll call that a game. You're not, you may be calling, keeping score. You're probably making, maybe, but maybe not. You're maybe making things up as you go along. OK. Whereas a sport, you're going to have standardized rules. Hey, this is how, uh, you know, in cricket, you have to run between the wickets exactly this way. You have to do it that way in Cape May Courthouse. You have to do it that way in Missouri. It's the same no matter where you go. Right. So I think that would de that defines a sport from a game. But also I like this. Uh, I listened to a story and they gave a talk about early baseball like last year. I think I went on the Zoom for it. And I really liked how he described this. He said, it's a game taken seriously by adults, right? If an, if an adult really cares about this type of game, it's probably going to be a sport because an adult's going to put all that types of organization and standardization into it that kids just don't have the capability for. Um, so I really like that description, that a sport is a game taken seriously by adults. So here I just have some pictures of early sports. Uh, on the bottom left, what I believe we're looking at it's like an early form of lacrosse, kind of. Um, you can see if you follow my cursor, that that's like a net at the end of a stick. We have a ball over here. Um, notice there are no defined lines. There's no like field, right? There's no yard markers. There's no goal. You even have a dog running around in the middle here. Okay. Um, there's no specific equipment. These guys, these little kids are just dressed how kids in the 1700s might be dressed. Here, I believe this is rounders. OK, uh, I'm not positive of that, but um, actually, no, I'm sorry, not rounders, cricket. OK, because you have these wickets here. If you know anything about cricket, the guy bowling the ball is trying to knock over those wickets. 
the guy hitting the ball is trying to run back and forth between wickets here as many times as possible for the team fields it. Okay. Now you do have some standardization here. You have, it looks like two umpires here. I believe those are right. But you also, again, you don't really see lines out here. You see those wickets, but not much else. Uh, people aren't wearing uniforms. It's just an open field. And then rowing. Um, some of you may know I coach rowing. Uh, I rowed in high school and college, so rowing is a sport that's dear to my heart. It's also one of the first sports, um, the first college athletic competition, if you want to call it that. We'll talk about this next week or in the next lecture, but it was a rowing race in 1851. All right. So rowing was really popular amongst because a lot of people worked at shipyards and they'd have little boats they had to go around to do their work. And they thought, hey, you know what? We should race these things. And that's what they did. So rowing goes back a long, long way. Um, but these are just some examples of those sports before industrial times. OK, so that's the end of that. Lecture there, OK. I'm going to send out an email to kind of give you some more explanation and writing of the things I've talked about, just about the you know organization of the course. Um, but I think I gave the basic rundown there. Again, please let me know if I'm going to send out this survey soon about sports you'd be interested in learning more about that I'm not covering. Um, so please fill that out. I'll take a week um, to, if I have to study up more, I'll study up more and give you the information um, you're looking for. Um, but please make sure to respond to that when I do send it out. I think that's all I have for this lecture. Uh, the next one's going to be more in depth. We're going to go pretty much straight into the material the next one, and that'll be sport in the industrial era, right? And that changes a lot of things. The industrial revolution changes a lot of things. And that's why I told you, uh, history is a study of change over time. Well, you're going to find that out in the industrial revolution, how much things did change over time, how we can learn about that, about how regular people lived in the 1800s through studying sports, okay? Which is a more interesting way to study it probably for you guys than maybe um, some other ways to do it. So uh, remember to watch this video and all the videos after. Uh, I feel like I'm a YouTuber right now, and I have to say, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe. You do not have to hit that like button and subscribe, but please do go uh, to the Canvas page where you can find this link for the YouTube channel and watch all these videos. All right, so I'm going to try to remember how to stop recording now. Bingo. All right, see you guys in the next one.